In 1 Corinthians 10, Paul describes who our God is because he's talking to people who believe in the one true and living God and he's convincing them of something regarding his person and what or how knowing the person of your God can keep you from certain things, specifically temptation. So he starts off in verse 1, he says, Moreover, brethren, I do not want you to be unaware that all our fathers were under the cloud, all passed through the sea, all were baptized into Moses in the cloud and in the sea, all ate the same spiritual food, and all drank the same spiritual drink, for they drank of that spiritual rock that followed them, and that rock was Christ. So they looked at the man and the water and all that as Maybe the work of God, but Moses was it. And Paul is making it clear that it was all God. It was all God. It was from the Spirit of God. And that rock was Christ. Because you have to remember that not everyone knew that Christ was God at that time. So he's telling them something. He's educating them on something about who their God really is. They knew what Christ did. So when he identifies Christ as God... That means God did what Christ did. God did these things. They already knew that. So then he connects that to Christ. Christ is the one who did all those things for Israel. Getting them out of Egypt. Getting through the Red Sea. Giving them food to eat and water to drink. And God came here as the man Christ Jesus. But with most of them God was not well pleased. For their bodies were scattered in the wilderness. That's because they didn't believe. Now these things became our examples to the intent that we should not lust after evil things as they also lusted. The lusting wasn't the emphasis. It was a secondary thing or a byproduct related to their unbelief. It was because they did not believe that their God was sufficient, that he was adequate, that he was enough, that they did those things. That's why it's significant whether or not you truly believe or you just mouth words. And do not become idolaters as were some of them, as it is written, the people sat down to eat and drink and rose up to play. Verse 8, nor let us commit sexual immorality as some of them did, and in one day 23,000 fell. Nor let us tempt Christ. Remember, he identified Christ as the one true and living God. Tempting God is the same as tempting Christ. Christ was there with them in the wilderness. Christ delivered them from... Egypt, Christ did all of it. Don't tempt him, as some of them also tempted, and were destroyed by serpents. Nor complain, as some of them also complained, and were destroyed by the destroyer. Again, he's not saying you will be destroyed. He's just saying don't do what they did. It's not edifying. It doesn't produce anything good to be complaining. When you know better, you know who your God is. Your God is the one who came as the man Christ Jesus to give himself for you. Now all these things happened to them as examples, and they were written for our admonition, upon whom the ends of the ages have come. Therefore let him who thinks he stands take heed lest he fall. That's just reminding them, you don't stand by yourself, you stand with Christ. He is your foundation, your only foundation. No temptation has overtaken you except such as is common to man. But God is faithful, who will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you are able, but with the temptation will also make the way of escape, that you may be able to bear it. Therefore, my beloved, flee from idolatry. He describes who your God is, and he makes it clear who God is, and what our strength is. It's trusting in him, not in ourselves, not thinking that we are the ones who are doing the standing. He stands for us so we can stand with him. So you know, when he says, no temptation has overtaken you except such as is common to man, he's acknowledging we do get tempted. We do get tempted. We have our flesh. That's common. It's the devil that wants to make you think that this is uncommon or particularly evil. No, it's just commonly evil because we're all, we're all born with this flesh that is evil. The Lord said that. He said, if you being evil know how to give good gifts to your children, he knows what we're made of. He knows that we are dust. He has compassion on us. 
and sympathy. He loves us and He cares for us. So knowing that we have these temptations that are common to all men, God is faithful, who will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you are able, but with the temptation will also make the way of escape, that you may be able to bear it. Therefore, that's a huge therefore, this is why, my beloved, flee from idolatry. In other words, God could see down the corridors of time, so to speak, and see that there would be all this false theology, all these doctrines of men, all these rudiments of the world that would say that God is not simply God. The simplicity that is in Christ that Paul speaks of also, I think it's in Corinthians, second or 1 Corinthians, anyway, it's in Corinthians. The simplicity that is in Christ. I'm not saying it's easy, but it is simple. You have a God and He saved you. 1 Corinthians 2, 2 says, For I determined not to know anything. I have determined not to know anything, Paul says, among you, except Jesus Christ and Him crucified. Those are the two main things He wants to teach everyone. Why wouldn't it be the Father and that He gave the Son? That's not necessary because Christ is the Father giving Himself. Christ is the Father in the world. So He comes here as the Son. That's who Christ is. He is the answer to the question, what if the Father became a man? Jesus Christ is the answer to that question. So, that therefore, like I say, it's huge because that is your way of escape from those temptations that caused them to fall because after all, what did they do? They made other gods. And it wasn't just the golden calf. Later on throughout time, the Babylonians and all that, they took on their gods, which were usually an assortment of gods most common number being three, but it's an example. That's why I said this is an example. They, they, these things were written for our admit, admonition, so we could learn from them and not do that, not think of our God in this way. Jesus is your one true and living God, and that is the thing. When you know that, you are fleeing from idolatry. You are not embracing, you are not believing the lie of idolatry. One of the facets of which is, that God is more than one person. There's many facets to idolatry, and connected to God is more than one person is, in essence, you are God. Functionally speaking, you are God, because you determine which one of these God people you will commune with, pray to, listen to, whatever, at any given time. you got to be honest with yourself. How often does one of these three people come and say, hey, it's me, the Holy Spirit. Hey, it's me, it's Jesus. Just want you to know, it's not the Father. No, you decide which one of them you will commune with, speak to, think about. You are practicing idolatry. And that is why so many people in the church system are so full of sin. And the church has just as much, if not more, sin than the world does because they're so occupied or preoccupied with it, because they are wrapped up in idolatry and religion and all the religious precepts that say you must focus on your sin. But if you want to be changed from glory to glory, as Paul says again in 2 Corinthians 3.18, you look at Him, you focus on Him, the one and only true and living God. That's why he alternates it back and forth, God, Christ, Jesus. He doesn't say that so... It, you can know he's talking about this one or that one. No, he says it that way so that you can know that that is one person. Christ did something in a way that God didn't when he is in heaven. He never left heaven. He never said he left heaven. He said he came down from heaven. So that's your escape. It's knowing the one true and living God, Jesus Christ. It's being free from the, the bondage of being your own God through a belief in a fake God because fake gods are gods that you always have control over and you really can have power over all that stuff, all those temptations. doesn't mean they will, they will flee from you and you will never have them. The point is though, you will have power over them when they come at you because you know who your God is. If you don't know who your God is, you're standing on quicksand. You're not standing on the rock. That there's only one rock. Remember, he said that early on in this passage. And all drank the same spiritual drink, for they drank of that spiritual rock that followed them, and that rock was Christ. 
Christ is our rock. Does that mean the Father is not our rock? Does that mean the Holy Spirit is not our rock? That's a clue. Anything that teaches you about what or who God is not is false. It is a lie. It's demonic. Anything that says he is not, the God who says I am is really not? Well, it depends on which one of them you're talking about or two. Demonic. That's my opinion. So, know who your God is and be free from this and fight with confidence. When you have these things coming in your mind, you can resist them. You, you know, you can know, you will win the battle because you have your one God on your side. That is the strength. That is the way out. That is the safety. That is the Lord Jesus. In Jesus' name, amen.